Hi there. Since you listen to this wonderful show, you are clearly fond of learning about the often overlooked history of third world countries. It just so happens. I host a show called History of Asia. It gives you a broad overview of that continent's past, focusing on the stuff that still matters. I think it's hard to understand how historical events have shaped our world and why they remain relevant unless you know what happens afterward. Therefore, History of Asia starts off in the present. Then I explain how it got to that point by delving ever deeper into the past. If you'd like to join me on this journey, check out the podcast History of Asia by Christoph Aerts. Now, let's enjoy History of Africa. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last week, we learned about the revolutionary army reforms instituted by Ose Tutu and his Akwamu advisors, and how they began the transition of the Ashanti army away from an outdated, feudal army into a modern, professional war machine. Now, let's see this new army get put to use when the Ashanti finally square off against their long-time hated overlords, the Denshira. Season 3, Episode 5 the Ashanti Empire is born at Feyasi. So, the year is 1701. The Ashanti had just undergone a tumultuous few decades. Their king had been killed by the invading Dorma, his nephew had escaped prison to become the new king, and completely reshaped the military of the Ashanti alliance into a new fighting force. While reforming the Ashanti army was still an ongoing and unfinished process, the army had already shown success in repelling the Dorma out of Ashanti lands. However, the real challenge that the army had to face was not the Dorma, but the Denshira. While the Denshira Hene had been distracted with a different set of wars to the south for a while, in 1701, these wars lulled to a pause. Now the Denshira army was free to march north and remind the Ashanti that they were mere vassals to the Denshira. Regardless of the Ashanti's anger against the Denshira for the increasingly heavy tribute burden, or the failure to protect them against the Dorma invaders, or their long-standing habit of kidnapping young noblemen, the Denshira Hene would put them in their place. And, looking at this battle, it's easy to see that the Denshira were the clear favorites to emerge the victor. The Ashanti had been the Denshira's subjects for as long as anyone could remember. The Denshira army was modern, well-equipped with the latest firearms whose designs had been bought from European merchants, and which had its supplies frequently replenished by an empire's worth of local craftsmen who manufactured guns and ammunition. Not to mention, the army was composed of combat-hardened veterans of numerous campaigns against the Fanti, Chuifo, and Adansi. And, while the Ashanti had shown some surprising success in their recent battle against the Dorma, it was only one battle. Sure, the Ashanti had allegedly undergone some serious reforms, but they were still mostly an army of conscripted peasants, each more loyal to their local king than any supposed Ashanti alliance. Despite Ose Tutu's attempts to modernize the army, most of them still fought with the traditional Aquafena sword, and few of them possessed firearms. And, representatives of the Kumasehene, Ose Tutu, had promised free land to any members of the Denshira army who defected to the Ashanti side. This promise convinced a couple minor Denshira commanders to switch sides, but, for the most part, this campaign's effect on the Denshira's numbers seems to have been minor and not even really noticeable. So, the Denshira Hene, Ntim Yakari, was obviously and rightly confident in his prospects of victory as his army marched north. And, at first, his confidence seemed to be well-placed. In small skirmishes with the Shanti militias at the villages of Adunku and Abwatem, the Denshira emerged the clear victor. Then, things seemed to be getting even better. At the village of Aputogya, the Denshira saw the main Ashanti force for the first time. The Denshira Hene ordered an attack, and his army engaged immediately and with ferocity, pushing back the Ashanti lines. The Ashanti army was peppered with attacks for miles as they withdrew, never breaking but always on the back foot until they reached a town called Feyasi. Feyasi was just down the road from Kumasi, the Ashanti capital, so the Ashanti forces couldn't afford to retreat anymore. After all, if they tried to move any further, they'd basically be surrendering their own capital to the Denshira. And if he won here, Gyakari could rest assured that Kumasi would fall and victory would be in his hand. He ordered his army to attack. However, this was a mistake. You see, Gyakari had actually significantly underestimated the size of the Ashanti army. Those militias he had beaten in the early war? They were probably not really militias, but scouting parties. The full Ashanti army that he engaged with with Apotioga was not the full Ashanti army at all, but rather just the forward guard and main body. And the Denshira had not pushed them back, but in reality, had themselves been pulled in 
Suddenly, the wings of the Ashanti army poured onto the battlefield. When the Denshira army attempted to reposition themselves from this emerging foe, the forward guard turned their heels and began a brutal attack from the front, forcing the Denshira to turn back and fight towards the front again. Soon, the Ashanti wings fully encircled the Denshira, attacking them from all sides and ensuring no escape. Most of the Denshira army, including the Denshira Hane Gyakari himself, were killed. The few men who managed to survive the battle were either enslaved, conscripted into the Ashanti army, or, for the very few of the few, some managed to escape back into Denshira territory. The new Ashanti army had done it. Not only had they defeated their larger, technologically superior foe, but they had done so in a devastating and decisive fashion. With this tremendous victory, the Ashanti, as well as the Denshira's other numerous enemies, leapt on the territory of the dying empire. With its army's corpses lying cold at Feyase, there was nobody to turn these invaders back. The Fonti seized control of the coast, while the Adansi and Chuifo took some territories along each of their borders. However, the lion's share of Denshira's territory was occupied by none other than the Ashanti Alliance. This included the two most valuable prizes within the Denshira Empire, their capital city of Abankeseso and the gold mines at Obuasi. And, when pillaging the towns of their previously merciless overlords, the Ashanti army did not hold back. The city of Abankeseso, once a sizable metropolis that was said to encompass 77 blocks, was stripped of anything value. The city's treasury, royal palace, and even the personal possessions of the city's working class inhabitants were all seized. And Ose Tutu was not afraid of letting his men rub the glory of their victory in the face of the city's civilian population. To quantify the exact amount of wealth that they were seizing, the Ashanti army actually laid all of it out on the city streets, where all of the inhabitants could see it, before meticulously taking a very thorough census of its value, before recollecting it and sending it back to Kumasi as a war trophy. Aban Keseso, once the greatest city in all of Ghana, was now an empty husk with all of its wealth appropriated. Upon arriving back in Kumasi, Ose Tutu was greeted with immense enthusiasm, as you might expect. I mean, he had not only scored an immense victory over the Ashanti's hated longtime overlord, but he brought back an impressive load of war booty as the cherry on top. However, while the war had been won, and Ashanti independence was now a reality, there had to have been a lingering feeling of, okay, now what? Would the Ashanti alliance dissolve, and the region would go back to being ruled by multiple independent city-states? And, if the alliance stays together, would it continue to be an alliance of theoretically equal members? Or would it be an Oyoko Empire, an empire ruled by and for the city of Kumasi? Well, whatever the answer would end up being, it would be chosen by one man, Ose Tutu himself. You see, while the reforms and improvements to the Ashanti army had done a lot to improve the Ashanti's fighting capabilities, it also featured serious political ramifications. By uniting the numerous militias and local forces of the Ashanti tribes into one force, a force that had been trained, led, and most importantly, promised pay by Ose Tutu himself, he was basically making it his army. So, now that he commanded the loyalty of the Shanti Empire, he held all the real power. However, despite having this monopoly on military power, and basically being able to do whatever he wanted, Ose Tutu was quite forward-thinking. While he had the capability to bring all of Ashanti land under his own despotic control, why would he do that? Would that system be sustainable? Would it even outlive his lifetime? So, Ose Tutu chose to compromise between his two options of an autonomous alliance of city-states and a despotic absolute monarchy. From his position in Kumasi, Ose Tutu would become the Ashante Hene, the first man to claim the title of the king of all Ashantis while actually having the power to back it up. However, Ose Tutu had no intention of refusing to share this new power. While he would be the king of all Ashantis, he would continue to allow the other Ashanti kings domain over their own cities. Ose Tutu also tried to explicitly make clear that the new Ashanti kingdom would not be an Oyoko empire, but would be an empire of all of the Ashanti tribes. Abandoning the Oyoko's sacred animal, the falcon, as his personal seal, Ose Tutu instead chose the porcupine, an animal which no tribe had claimed as their sacred animal. Not only that, but the three kings who had aided him in the Ashanti alliance, the kings of Joaben, Bekwai, and Mampong, would each be given a spot on what was called the Kotoko. The Kotoko, meaning porcupine in the Chui language, was a royal advisory board comprised of these three kings and the Ashantehene's wife. 
Later Ashanti kings would expand the council to include several royal bureaucrats, including a finance minister, justice counselor, war counselor, and a special representative for the city of Kumasi itself. The closest familiar parallel I can make to the powers of the Kotoko is kind of like a combination of the U.S. cabinet and the House of Lords. While the Kotoko was primarily an advisory and bureaucratic body, it did have the ability to outright veto the Ashantahene's decision, and even, in some cases, petition for his removal. In addition to laying out this power-sharing agreement, Osetutu also created a new institution to protect the stability of the Ashanti state after his death. This was the famous Golden Stool, the silhouette of which is the design at the center of this season's podcast cover. Now, before I talk about the stool, I need to make a quick note on the importance of stools in Akan culture. So, a stool, or dua in Akan, was a short chair, and pretty much everyone among the Akan possessed one, even the poorest of the poor. In Akan traditional belief, the stool upon which someone sat contained basically their soul. So, when someone died, the stool they possessed was viewed with extreme reverence, and was even often passed down as heirlooms in a family. In addition to their sacred status, stools were also an important social indicator. While almost everyone possessed a stool, not all stools were created equal. Some stools, nicknamed two-coin stools, were incredibly cheaply made, constructed with crude, simple carpentry, and made of low-quality wood. Others were made with expensive, imported timber, and embossed with intricate designs meant to showcase the wealth of the person who sat on it. These two factors combined led stools to also become an important part of government among the Akan. Stools in Akan states functioned kind of like crowns, but even more sacred. By containing the souls of previous monarchs, the royal stool marked the legitimacy of a leader, as well as potentially serving as a means to show off their kingdom's wealth. So, from now on, when I talk about leaders being instooled or destooled or anything like that, Think of it as meaning the same thing as crowned or decrowned. So, this reverence of stools was kind of a problem for Osetutu. Throughout his time as Kumase Hene, Osetutu had sat on the royal stool of Kumasi. However, he couldn't continue sitting on the stool, as it was, you know, the stool of Kumasi, not the royal stool of all of Ashantiland. However, he couldn't just throw this stool out and get a new one. Remember, it contained the soul of his ancestors and was a sacred object, so that is a Big no-no. So, if Ose Tutu was going to get a new stool to show off his position of Ashantahene, it would take a real miracle. So, there are two versions of what happened next. The traditional Ashanti retelling, and my personal, slightly skeptical retelling. According to the traditional story, the Ashanti head cleric, Anochie, was just hanging out one day when he heard about Ose Tutu's dilemma. So, he used his spiritual powers to convince the ancestors in heaven to gently float a stool made of solid gold directly onto the lap of the Ashantahene. Due to this divine intervention, the king had no choice but to throw up his hands and take the new stool as a seat of power, as to not anger the ancestors in heaven. Now, in my interpretation, I'm a little bit skeptical of the part where the golden stool is summoned from the sky. While the stool is certainly beautifully crafted, there is some pretty obvious evidence that it is beautifully crafted by human hands. My perception is that Osetutu and Anochie ordered the creation of the stool by a group of the best goldsmiths in the kingdom who were sworn to secrecy, and that the story of the stool's descent was later used to legitimize Osetutu's decision to adopt a new stool, specifically for his new position of Ashanti Hene, and as a way to justify his moving on from the old stool of Kumasi. Anyways, the Ashanti Hene's new stool was not only an impressive sight to behold, but was also an incredibly important political tool. You see, throughout Ashanti history, the stool would go on to act as something of its own legal entity. Again, I need to make a comparison to the concept of the crown in other countries' laws. While Ose Tutu was just a man who would eventually pass on, by investing power officially in the stool, which he only acted on the behalf of, Ose Tutu aimed to secure the loyalty of the state not to himself personally, but to whichever person happened to occupy the stool in the future. This decision would prove to be incredibly successful, as the institution of the Golden Stool would aid immensely in the cultivation of a stable Ashanti state in the future. And, given the clear ambiguity that can come with a large number of legitimate heirs produced by matrilineal succession, the stool's institutional stability would prove incredibly necessary throughout the rest of Ashanti history. Not to mention, remember, Ose Tutu's rule was born from instability that followed the unexpected death of a king. So, by investing power officially not in any individual man, but instead in an undying stool, 
the Ashanti realm could remain stable if something similar happened to him. Foreshadow, foreshadow. So, as the dust settled from the victory against the Denshira, the Ashanti Empire was born. However, at this point, the Ashanti state still basically only encompassed the area surrounding the four cities of the Kotoko Council. While the war with the Denshira had technically captured certain parts of the Denshira realm, actual Ashanti influence in the region was pretty minimal, and the garrisons occupying the Denshira lands were small, as most of the Ashanti army had returned to Kumasi. However, while the Denshira had been immensely weakened by their defeat at Feyasi, they were not defeated entirely. A small Denshira rump state, composed of the few surviving Denshira elites and military men, held up in the south of their former territory, maintaining control of the old capital of Jukwa. And the new Denshira Hene, a man whose name has been lost to time, waited patiently for his army to recover. Five years after the Battle of Feyasi, he determined that his army was once again able to face off against the Ashanti in battle. They marched from Jukwa to Abankeseso, overpowering the small Ashanti garrison and recapturing their old capital city. However, this victory for the Denshira was short-lived. Osetutu, upon hearing news of this invasion, reacted swiftly. The Ashanti army once again marched on Abankeseso, aiming not only to recapture the city, but to stomp out their rival once and for all. The city fell to a year-long siege, and this time it was not only stripped of its valuables, but actively and systematically demolished building by building. Then the Ashanti army moved on to Jukwa and swiftly defeated the reeling Denshira army. And just like that, in 1707, the Denshira were truly defeated, and the entirety of the rump state was incorporated under Ashanti influence. The brief days where a small garrison exercised light control of captured Denshira territories was over. As from now on, sizable contingents of military police would frequently patrol the territory to ensure that the locals felt Ashanti influence. While a man would still be allowed to sit on the Jukwa throne and still claim the title of Denshira Hene, he was now a vassal, not a rival, of the Ashanti. And while the kings of Denshira would never truly forget their animosity and defeat at the hands of the Ashanti, they were now forced to reluctantly pledge support and pay tax to their new Ashanti overlords. With the Denshira now defeated, the position of Central Ghana's regional hegemon was now up for grabs. In addition to the Ashanti, the kingdoms of Adansi, Fanti, and Chuifal were all valid contenders for the position, and each of them practiced a version of modern warfare similar to the Denshira, though with varying degrees of refinement. Previously, while these kingdoms had never really been allies per se, their mutual hatred of the Denshira had for the most part ensured that they were too busy with their common enemy to be fighting each other. However, with the Denshira gone, this informal truce dissolved, and fighting erupted almost immediately. The sudden collapse of the Denshira also attracted the surprise of the European merchants in their coastal forts. For a century now, the Denshira had acted as the premier commercial ally to European merchants. They had provided a stable supply chain of gold, slaves, and other precious exports, and the Denshira government was an enthusiastic customer to European imports. Not to mention that every European power had some degree of diplomatic friendliness with the Denshira Hene. Now that the empire had collapsed, the Europeans had to decide what to do in this new post-Denshira Ghana. This usually meant desperately trying to cultivate a new alliance with whichever kingdom happened to be in the closest proximity to their forts. For the Dutch, this new ally would be the Ashanti, whose successes in their war with the Denshira convinced the Dutch that they were the rising power in the region. Wanting to get their foot in the door early when it came to establishing relations with the rising Ashanti, the Dutch East India Company sent an ambassador to Kumasi the moment they heard of Osetutu's victory. David von Yendale, the chosen representative, brought an extensive array of gifts to the Ashanti Hene, and proclaimed that he sought good relations with the Ashanti. Now, Osetutu was no fool. The Dutch had just been allies of their Denshira enemies, so it was obvious that this mission was just a desperate attempt to reconcile relations with the new big boys in town. However, even though this envoy was obviously cynical, Osetutu also understood the potential benefits of good relations with the Dutch. Not only would good relations aid their access to European markets, but securing relations with the Dutch could prove crucial if the Ashanti were forced to fight a war to keep the trade corridor on the coast open. So the envoy was treated to lavish gifts of his own, and sent back with the message that the Ashanti would happily become the new partners of the Dutch.
The new Dutch Ashanti relationship was one of circumstance, a relationship of shared interest rather than shared love. But it would gradually blossom into a deeply entwined alliance that will play a major role for the rest of the podcast. Now that the Danchira could no longer play the role of the restrictive middleman for European goods, these products proliferated throughout Ghana. Firearms, once an incredibly expensive rarity, significantly dropped in price and became a mainstay in every southern Ghanaian army, including the Ashanti. However, while Ose Tutu's rising empire had captured many of the Danchira's old territories, their ability to profit from trade with Europe was somewhat limited compared to the old hegemons. The states of southern Ghana, like Fanti, Ichwifu, and Adansi, and city-states of the Ga people, each had a policy of heavily taxing merchants that went in and out of their territories, including Ashanti merchants. You see, while the Ashanti had made many important territorial acquisitions through defeating the Denshira, they had not yet acquired much territory on the coast. So Ashanti trade with Europeans had to primarily be conducted indirectly, with the coastal states, not Denshira, now acting as middlemen. This relationship, while very profitable for the coastal states, came to the extreme detriment of the Ashanti. Because of this relationship, European goods were now more expensive for the Ashanti, and they had to export their own goods to European merchants on the coast for less profit. To make matters worse, the Ashanti lacked a complete monopoly on the flow of European goods further to the north, as the Adansi Kingdom, also known as Achim, which I'm going to be calling them from now on because it's more accurate, operated an alternative route. While well, the Ashanti did profit from their control of Jukwa, and the fact that this strategically located city allowed them to control the flow of European trade goods from the southwest, the southeast of Ghana was entirely outside their sphere of influence. The lack of control over coastal territories also had important implications for the financial health of the Ashanti state. You see, in the Akan region of West Africa, gold was not an uncommon sight. The recently seized gold mines in Obuasi were some of the largest in the world, and gold could commonly be found by panning through the riverbeds throughout the forest region. Due to gold's ubiquity, it wasn't really all that valuable to the Akan. I mean, why would you use a substance as a currency that pretty much anyone can just pull out of a river? So, with gold's value not even that impressive, most Akan instead used cowries, or small glossy shells of marine snails, as currency. Cowrie shells, you see, are not native to West Africa. They can only be found in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, so they were an incredibly rare and precious commodity, and worked great as a currency. But, you know, these shells were, by necessity, imported. So, if the Ashanti didn't have direct access to the coast, they would have to buy these crucial pieces of currency at a markup from the coastal people. And, you know, buying money at a markup is a recipe for economic disaster. If you want to learn more about the history of cowrie shell currency and its strange economic effects throughout Africa and the Indian Ocean, you can access the newest premium episode on the topic by supporting the show on Patreon. Me and my editor put an absolutely absurd amount of work into making this podcast happen, and we make almost nothing in return. So if you've enjoyed listening to this free educational show we put out on the internet, or if you'd like to access the dozens of premium episodes we've already made, as well as those that we haven't made yet about various topics in African history, please consider supporting us on patreon.com slash historyofafrica. And to those of you who are already supporting us, I'd like to give you a sincere and heartfelt thank you. So, Ose Tutu began planning his first true war of Ashanti expansion. His goal, which he had formulated with Anoche, was to attack the Chwifu, who he perceived as the weakest of the major kingdoms in southern Ghana, and then enjoy greater access to the trade of cowries and other European-delivered goods in the south. To aid in this attack, Ose Tutu established contact with a people called the Wasa. The Wasa, a small Akan group in the southwest of Ghana, had lived varyingly under Denshira and Chuifo domination, and were currently under the thumb of the latter. So, in exchange for their support, Ose Tutu promised the Wasahane that he would be granted an autonomous status under Ashanti protection if the war was won. He accepted this proposition. The Chuifu were unable to match the strength of the Ashanti force, and were also preoccupied with Wasa rebels, so they were swiftly defeated in 1712, and the realm was annexed into the Ashanti Empire, securing direct access to European trading forts on the coast. With his first truly expansionist victory notched on his belt, Ose Tutu decided that he would continue this expansionist policy. His next goal, now that access to cheap European goods was secure, was the ability to monopolize the trade of European goods in the north. 
With Tuifel under Ashanti control, the only real alternative route for European goods to flow north passed through Achiam, specifically the economically important capital of Fomena. So, after allowing his army to recover for five years, Ose Tutu marched his army into Achiam territory. Initially, this war went incredibly well for the Ashanti. In the first battles of the war, the Ashanti emerged as the easy victors, chasing the Achiam out of the northern half of their kingdom. Ostensibly, the war was, in a sense, won already, as the capital of Fomena was part of the region captured by Ashanti forces. However, according to the traditional retelling of events, Ose Tutu apparently began to get a little bit cocky. He began neglecting the traditional Ashanti religious rites associated with warfare, even neglecting to wear a specific type of amulet that was supposed to serve as a good luck charm on the battlefield. Ose Tutu decided that he wasn't satisfied with his gains in the north, and decided that he wanted to advance into the southern half of Achiam territory. But while advancing south, the Ashanti were stopped by the Pra River. Not wanting to call off the invasion, Ose Tutu ordered that they would cross the river, and he himself would lead the first party across. As they glided across the gentle river on a small canoe, everything at first appeared calm, until, suddenly, the riverbank erupted with the sound of shouting and gunfire. A group of Achem scouts had spotted Ose Tutu's boat in the river and began firing at the unprepared men on board. Many of them were killed, including Ose Tutu himself, whose last words were said to be, If only I knew, presumably referring to the underestimation of his enemy. Now, this story is, well, dubious in how true it is. The concept of the king refusing to wear his protective amulets only to get his immediate comeuppance seems a little bit too fable-like to me. Like, its moral seems a little bit too obvious. It advises kings to respect the advice of religious officials and always do the traditional religious rites before battle. However, the important parts of the story, including Ose Tutu's death while on campaign, are certainly true. Shocked from the first Ashanti Hane's sudden demise, were forced to cancel their plans of crossing the river, limiting their conquest to the northern half of Achiam. Other retellings of the war with Achiam vary, claiming that, instead of an ambush on the river, that the Ashanti actually successfully crossed. However, due to the rapid expansion of the Ashanti eastward, some of the king's Akumu advisors started to get worried. The further that the Ashanti traveled east, the closer they were actually getting to Akumu territory. So how long would it be until the Ashanti were actually a threat to their allies? They devised a treacherous plot to stop this expansion, and, during a skirmish with the Achem, these Akwamu officers assassinated Ose Tutu. This retelling, though also dubious in some respects, seems to align better with certain political developments around this time. As we'll see next episode, the relationship between the Akwamu and Ashanti would suddenly and unexpectedly deteriorate after Ose Tutu's death, and this story provides a potential explanation as to why that happened. Regardless of how he died, Ose Tutu is pretty much unanimously regarded by most historians and laymen alike as the greatest king to have ever ruled the Ashanti Empire. And it's not really hard to see why. I mean, he basically created the empire out of scratch, and you can't get much better than that. Forging a powerful empire from a small tributary state is impressive enough, but doing it while defeating a century-old regional hegemon and establishing institutions which will last well beyond your lifetime is something that very few great leaders in history can claim. His legacy in Ashanti history is, simply put, unparalleled. Basically, if you remember back to our episodes on Azana and Caleb of Oxum, you'll remember my reference to the Civilization video games, and the same is true here. If the Ashanti were added to Civ, Ose Tutu would undoubtedly be their leader. While his participation in the slave trade, which he did enthusiastically and extensively participate in by selling off Denshira prisoners of war, and the morally ambiguous foundation of his empire taint his legacy to modern eyes, it's important that we distinguish between a historical figure's personal morality and their impact on the world. Love him or hate him, Ose Tutu is undeniably important, and in terms of his effectiveness as a leader, I think his reputation as the best king of the Ashanti is well deserved. However, while Ose Tutu is generally regarded as the best king of the Ashanti, the Ashanti Empire is still just getting its feet under it right now. The empire is nowhere near the apex of its expansion, and Ose Tutu will not even be the king who did the most to enlarge the empire's territory. That title belongs to the next Ashanti Hene, Ose Tutu's grand nephew, who will expand the empire at a pace that will never be matched for the rest of Ashanti history. Join us for our next episode, 
when Osetutu's successor, Opokoware I, finishes what his great uncle started against the Achim, and even takes on the oldest of the Akan kingdoms. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then I'd encourage you to support the show. This can be done by a monetary donation to our Patreon, which can be found on our website, historyofafricapodcast.blogspot.com. By giving the show a review on iTunes, or by sharing the podcast to anyone who you think might be interested. This episode, like all of them, is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Raul Kanakia, Ayofagbamie, Kevin Johnson, Sarah Mpenza, Sean Burke, and Morgan Blackmore, among others. Thank you for your support and your help in making sure that this show keeps happening.